Italy has reported the highest one-day death toll from coronavirus than any other country. Officials said nearly 500 people died on Wednesday. Videos posted on social media are said to show military trucks in the city of Bergamo preparing to transport the dead to nearby cities. Mortuaries and crematoriums in Bergamo have run out of space. Medical teams from China have arrived to help authorities fight the virus. The governor of Italy's hardest hit region made this appeal to medical students and retired healthcare workers. I want to appeal to all of these doctors and nurses. Make yourselves available and lend us a hand in these trying times. In my opinion, through the cooperation and availability of these professional health workers, we can find important answers to the challenges we face. Let's bring in uh, journalist Sima Gupta, who's standing by for us in Rome. Sima, dramatic scenes there in northern Italy. The governor calling for help. Does he get the support he needs? Well, uh, that's what the, the governor if, of Lombardy is actually saying. I mean, he's made it very clear. Look, a uh, warning that at this stage, we may reach a situation soon where they won't be able to treat the sick at all. And it's ca he's calling on the residents in Lombardy, but also all around the country to essentially stay at home. And that's the message of the Prime Minister as well. Uh, he gave an interview to a local daily here, uh, essentially saying that the country and the measures that they're going to take, they expect them to get even stricter, uh, a complete block is what they're suggesting. The sports minister has already said that he's looking towards the idea of stopping all outdoor activity. That means no more any walks or, or jogging in the park, simply because they need to stay at home in order to limit the spread of COVID-19. There is also word that the uh, school closure will be extended beyond April 3rd. And that's because also we've seen uh, 43,000 violations of the lockdown measure in the space of one week. And the authorities and officials are imploring people to listen to the rules stay at home, practice social distancing, only leave home when it's absolutely necessary. They're very concerned. As, we, as you've said, we've seen these dramatic and immense numbers of the dead, just 475 dead with COVID-19 in the space of 24 hours. And it's because of that, I think, that the authorities believe that the next week or so is very crucial. The peak infection rate still has not been reached here in Italy. Now, as you say, I mean, people there, also where you are uh, further south, are faced with those uh, incredibly dramatic uh, images from northern Italy. Uh, will that help uh, to convince people to actually adhere to what the authorities tell them to do or not to do? Well, that's what the authorities are hoping for. That's what the doctors are imploring. We see uh, frontline medical professionals going on social media, imploring everyone, showing them, we go to work to save lives. You do your part. Stay at home. That seems to be the message that they're sending out. Here in Rome, for the most part, you do see people adhering to this. It's frustrating for people to be stuck at home. Uh, we're now into day nine of the lockdown. Families at home with their children having to deal with work on the one hand, as well as dealing with their children's schoolwork, trying to juggle all of that and manage. It's not easy, but if everyone does their part, as everyone keeps saying, we're all in the same boat. And so if everyone does their part, this will help limit the spread, not just up north, but also for the rest of the country that is also preparing for a rise in infections. Mm. Now, you talk about the doctors, the military uh, has been brought in to help with that but also they fast-tracked the graduation of medical students. All right, Seema Gupta there reporting for us from Rome. Thank you so much. Britain has also stepped up its response to the coronavirus. The Prime Minister announced that up to 20,000 military personnel will be put on standby. The United Kingdom is bracing for the stringent measures that will come into effect on Friday. In addition to schools, dozens of underground stations will be closed. Other public transport services will also be reduced. The government has advised people not to go to pubs and restaurants, though an official ban is not in effect.
Let's cross over now to London, where DW correspondent Birgit Maas is covering developments for us. Birgit, London, of course, is a big, huge city, and it's now facing strict containment measures, which the military could help to enforce. How are Londoners coping? Well, there is a sense of doom, I would say, across London, because I think a lot of people are expecting this to get even tighter and maybe uh, into a complete lockdown. At least this is the speculation in the media and on social media. So we might really see Londoners being confined to their homes. And what you see at the moment is that people are trying to go and shop as much as they can. So if you go into the supermarket in the afternoon, the shelves are really, really empty because people are expecting that there will be shortages in the future. Of course, the authorities are saying it's because the demand is so much. It's not that there is no supply of essential items like toilet paper or even food. It's because people are buying too much and they should stop it. But at the moment, it doesn't seem that uh, people are adhering to this advice because people are frankly very nervous of what's to come. All right. Well, people not following advice. We've seen that across Europe now. And as of tomorrow, schools all over the country will be closed. Did Prime Minister Boris Johnson take this step too late, perhaps, as his critics claim? Yes, there has been a lot of criticism towards uh, the government. There was, for example, the uh, editor-in-chief of The Lancet, a leading medical paper, and he has urged for weeks almost to look at what's happening in other countries, look at what's happening in Italy and just act earlier and be tougher. Now, the school closures come fairly late. They're only uh, in effect as of tomorrow, even though some schools have already closed now uh, voluntarily. But officially, um, as of tomorrow, the schools will be closed. The children of, of public health workers, uh, of health workers and of, of other people who are necessary for the infrastructure, for example, food delivery, they um, will be able to go into some schools. So there will be some sort of provision. But it's coming fairly late and a lot of people, hundreds of scientists, in fact, have uh, urged the government uh, over, over the weekend to, to be strict. And yes, uh, now finally it is happening. All right, Birgit Maas, the reporting in London. Thank you. Here in Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel has addressed the nation in an unprecedented televised speech, saying the country faces its biggest challenge since the Second World War. This says the country's top disease control official warns that Germany could be dealing with 10 million coronavirus infections in the coming months if its citizens don't adhere to measures outlined by the government. Berlin's most famous locations should be bustling with tourists at this time of year. But due to COVID-19, they are currently surrounded by empty streets. It's also highly unusual for a German chancellor to make a televised address, but Angela Merkel said these are extraordinary times. And she urged all citizens of Germany to seriously consider their own obligations to society. The situation is serious. Take it seriously. Since German unification, no, since the Second World War, there has been no challenge to our nation that has demanded such a degree of common and united action. She said Germany was in a good position, but warned that it could not be complacent. Germany has an excellent health system, perhaps one of the best in the world. We can take some confidence from that. But our hospitals, too, would be completely overstretched if too many patients with a severe corona infection were to be admitted in a short space of time. People in Berlin have been waiting in long queues to be tested for the COVID-19 virus. And there have been reports from other states of people having to wait in lines for long periods before they were finally tested. Across the country, Germans are having their nerves tested. New border regulations on the Polish border are causing massive traffic jams as far as the eye can see. In many places, authorities have begun extending police patrols to enforce new regulations on which shops are allowed to remain open. Cultural establishments, schools and nurseries are supposed to be closed, along with most non-grocery shops. Our officers are on patrol around the clock, with two groups of 100 each. In addition, we have undercover police officers, and their only mission is to enforce the regulations. 
So far, the German government has resisted placing a nationwide curfew, such as in Spain, France and Italy, but that could soon change. Countries, including Germany, are stepping up preparations to avoid the kinds of scenes that have been playing out in the hospitals of northern Italy. DW has been looking at the measures being taken in Berlin to ensure a large number of patients can be treated if and when the situation arises. A new hospital is being erected at an exhibition centre in Berlin, one of Germany's latest measures to tackle the pandemic. It's supposed to be able to treat a thousand people, set up with the help of the German army. In case we have shortages, we want to be able to avoid having serious bottlenecks by having something up our sleeves, a clinic which still has capacity. This is just a precautionary measure. The infection rate in Berlin is growing. Maybe this extra capacity might not even be enough. Here at the Robert Koch Institute, an ever-increasing number of positive cases are being tallied up. Just how long can the virus be kept under control? The answer is sobering. We're talking about years that this pandemic might take to go once around the world. Pandemics travel in waves, we know that. But how quick these waves are, and when these waves that we're speaking about come, where 60 to 70 percent of the people around the world will become infected, that will take years. In my view, I'd say two years. A crisis is coming our way, but we've been forewarned. That makes it easier, says the head of the Havelhör Clinic in Berlin. Harald Matters says they're well prepared. They've recently received 10 extra respirators, and the hospital could increase its capacity threefold if things got really bad. Furthermore, he's also readied his staff. We've also retrained anaesthetists and doctors from other specialties who haven't done intensive care duties for a long time now, so that we've managed to get a further 20 to 30 percent extra backup in personnel. And we could also get more from outpatient care. The daily numbers show that up till now, there hasn't been a single person with the coronavirus ending up in intensive care there. However, it's obvious that things won't stay that way. Statistics just in show what individual hospitals across the country can handle and where beds are available. That probably couldn't have come at a better time. In fact, the head of the German Hospital Federation says there's reason for both caution and reassurance. Findings show that about 15% of patients become so sick that they have to be treated in hospital. 4% of patients, in fact, then have to be treated in intensive care and put on ventilators. Furthermore, the government has planned that in extreme situations, even hotels and rehab centres could be transformed into treatment areas if there's a bed shortage. What could be a major turning point in the drive to contain the coronavirus? On Wednesday, China, the epicentre of the original outbreak, reported no new local cases of the infection for the first time since it began recording them in January. However, there were 34 new infections imported from abroad, which threatens the progress China has made. Beijing imposed stringent restrictions on travel and movement in an attempt to prevent the virus from spreading. The total number of confirmed coronavirus infections in mainland China stands at almost 81,000. Now, Taiwan has managed to keep its infection rate far lower than neighboring countries, despite its proximity to China, where the coronavirus originated. Weeks ago, the island was expected to become the second worst hit region after China, but that didn't happen. So what did Taiwan do to change the narrative? And how is it coping with the ongoing pandemic? DW's Phoebe Kong sent us the latest from Taiwan. Surgical masks and goggles have become part of Dr. Ho's uniform since the coronavirus outbreak began. He was among the first group of doctors in Taiwan to treat suspected patients. That was back in January, when the virus first spread from China across the strait. Taiwan is experienced in understanding China. We know what is reliable and when we should be skeptical. And because Taiwan has long been isolated from the international community, we must take more steps ahead of the crisis and use our own judgment. This is where he ended up sleeping. A dormitory next to the hospital set aside for medical staff like him. For Taiwan, 
Vigilance is the treatment for a disease with no cure. It was hard to identify misinformation at first. I was scared of spreading the virus to my family. I think this has to be a collective effort. If each of us takes very strict precautions ourselves, it eases the burden on the healthcare system. Other than medics and military, students and teachers at high school level and below are now banned from overseas travel. Foreigners are denied entry. But containing the virus is not only about border control. Communities have found themselves on the front line. District officer of the local government, Gary Kwan, monitors individuals under 14-day home quarantine. One of his duties is to take care of their daily needs, such as delivering fresh food. We help to make it easier for quarantined people to stay at home, to reduce the risk of contagion. If anyone leaves the apartment, we'll be alerted by text message and call the police. He or she may be fined. Quarantine in Taiwan may feel service-based, but it's also stringent. Individuals are under surveillance. Telecom providers are cooperating to enable the government to track people via their mobile phones. Health officials believe technology helps contain concern and prevent panic. One example is the face mask rationing system, where people can place their order and check availability online. New technology helps us to systemize containment policies in a transparent way. It helps the public build up a sense of trust in the government because they're well informed about the situation. Taiwan's next step is to broaden its testing regimen. Anyone with overseas travel history, fever or respiratory symptoms is eligible for testing. According to research, the spread of the virus can be largely contained if 60 percent of infection chains are broken. We're trying our best to achieve that. The island remains concerned about a potential massive outbreak. While waiting for a vaccine, community and government-led containment is the only way anyone knows how to fight the virus. Let's have a look at some of the other corona-related developments around the world. New Zealand and Australia are closing their borders to non-residents and non-citizens to protect their nations from the virus. Japan's deputy prime minister says holding the Summer Olympics would make no sense if countries can't send athletes. But the government says it is still working to hold the Games as scheduled. France has reported another spike in coronavirus deaths. Its death toll jumped by 89 to 264 people on Wednesday. And Russia has confirmed its first death. The patient was a 79-year-old woman who died in Moscow from pneumonia. The European Central Bank has announced a 750 billion euro bond buying program to help stabilize markets reeling from the fallout of the coronavirus outbreak. It's just one of many stimulus plans announced by policymakers across the developed world. However, investors are still uneasy and stocks keep tumbling. The carnage has returned to the Asian markets. The region's main indexes are all trading in the red. Stocks have continued to extend their earlier losses this week, after a moderate reprieve for some markets Wednesday. Investors in Asia appear to be taking cues from Wall Street. The Dow Industrials Index plunged more than 6 percent. The market decline continues even as lawmakers take further action to support individuals and businesses. On Wednesday, U.S. lawmakers approved a $100 billion package for free testing, sick pay and paid family leave. This is not some rescue following risky business decisions. Nobody thinks any of this is the fault of small businesses. So while I will support the House bill in order to secure some emergency relief for some American workers, I will not adjourn the Senate until we have passed a far bolder package that must include significant relief for small businesses all across our country. And across the pond, European policymakers also announced further stimulus measures. After an emergency meeting Wednesday evening, 
The ECB says it's setting aside 750 billion euros for bond buying to help ease the effects of a COVID-19 pandemic. Still, markets are falling. Investors are not convinced by the efforts of lawmakers. DW's Chelsea Delaney keeps an eye on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Uh, Chelsea, so far no aid package has managed uh, to lift the markets. Is the ECB stimulus going to make a difference? Well, this is obviously extremely necessary to keep money flowing to governments and, and to businesses within the EU. We did just see the DAX open uh, and a very volatile trade spike a bit higher. But uh, I think investors are, are asking the question, can any uh, package from a central bank, from a government, really do that much to offset the impact of this enormous economic shock we're facing? The ECB has estimated that growth uh, in the EU could contract by 5 percent this year. JP Morgan has estimated that uh, U.S. growth could fall 15 percent in the in the second quarter. Uh, so against that, these packages can cushion the blow, but it can only really offset a little bit of the of the damage that we're seeing. And I think investors are, are really trying to settle in for a longer period of volatility. One trader has called this uh, sort of like the panic buying we're seeing in grocery stores where investors are just selling everything mm -hmm. and trying to hoard up on, on cash. Right. Chelsea Delaney in Frankfurt. Thank you so much. The CEO of Lufthansa has warned that the coronavirus is jeopardizing the future of aviation. Carsten Spohr said governments may need to save the entire industry from the fallout of the pandemic. He added that Europe's largest airline is in good financial shape for now. International industry group IATA estimates up to $200 billion are needed to help cushion the blow of the outbreak.